one of the examples of somebody who started a business uh, shortly after being in the same seats that you are uh, without too much of a plan, um, but kind of figured it out as he went. And it's really, uh, it's a great story about what it takes to have an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, what it takes to believe in yourself and take action on an idea. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to Rob Angel, the founder of Pictionary. And welcome to the Sure, there's something we all rather be doing on a Friday night. Friday, it's, I'm from Seattle, as Jason pointed out, so I hate speakers coming up and talking about the weather. It's just unbelievable. So thank you guys for having me. Uh, but, and Jason said, I, I did picture, and I started picture I pretty much just after a little older than you guys are now. And for the concept of success, and that's what we want to talk about today. So when I was thinking of uh, what success meant for me, uh, I had no idea, right? Pictionary sold 38 million games, 60 countries, 45 languages, and by any stretch of the imagination, that's a success. But I didn't start out that way. I didn't have this big dream, this big call, big plan. What I had was this intention of creating a game that people would like. I had a blast playing Pictionary right before it actually was Pictionary, right? just doing that. So I said, okay, how do I turn this into something tangible that other people could play and have as great experience as I was? It was an experience, it wasn't a game. And so I started, uh, that's how it all started. And so uh, I'm kind of, we should play Pictionary right? to see how many people have pads and paper. Um, why don't we just go right to whatever you do in your mind, if you have a, Piece of paper. I want you to draw a picture of what you think the word success means. In your mind, if you don't have a pad of paper, what's visual? What's coming up in your mind? It's hard. <laughs> now, what did anybody? What, what do you have in your mind? Um, I do a big smiley face with arrows pointing to a bunch of little smiley faces because I think it's important to make yourself happy while also improving the lives of others. Very nice. Okay. I drew the American flag as a symbol of uh, what I see as success is just being able to have the freedom to do whatever you want. We'll talk a little bit about that soon. Anyone else? Well, that, that's the whole thing though. You know, there's all these different ideas. There's no right answer. There's no right answer to what's right for you. And when I was your age, and I graduated from college, my picture was completely blank. Absolutely no idea what I wanted to be. I didn't know what my vision of success was gonna look like. But I do know, anybody, anybody valedictorian wanna be a valedictorian? Huh? Anybody shooting for 2.9 GPA? Good for you. That's what I graduated with. So don't let your grades fool you. So 2.9, very proud of that. Took five years. So, so I decide to, to uh, graduate and I moved to Spokane where I grew up and moved in with three buddies. And one day, one night, one of them said, you guys want to play a game of charades on paper. What's that? Well, we draw sketches to each other, the four of us sketches to each other and we just try to guess what they are okay two guys here two guys there we start sketching but we're just having a blast drinking beer wait uh, late night we all wait uh, waiting tables and all of a sudden it's like three in the morning we said this would make a good board game kind of just a silly little game this would make a good board game so i started thinking about it thinking about it thinking about it and then i decided to give it a try Right? So it's just so much fun, I wanted to share. So I get ready to go, I'm gonna create this game and look at it and I panic. Absolutely get in my head. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get started. I'm only a waiter. I was stuck, completely stuck. I was 22 years old, completely stuck. And I, I, I couldn't get out of it and I couldn't get started. I panicked, I just stopped. 
put it away, put that idea, that concept away for two years. Two years. I tried real estate, tanked badly. Uh, sold vacuum cleaners door to door, sucked. Uh, tried pizza joint, that didn't work out. So two years later, I went, okay, let me give this a try. Let me give this a try. So instead of sitting down with the same mindset two years later, I went, okay, what can I do to take the first, smallest, simplest, easiest first step to get started? I, I could visualize you know, Pictionary over here, but all the things get ne necessary to get there, marketing plan, business plan, production issues, forget it. So the easiest thing was the word list, right? Just, well, I, I didn't overthink it anymore. I'm gonna make the word list. So I went in the backyard with a dictionary, pad of paper, and a pen, and I opened up the dictionary. I'm looking, I'm looking through the first word that made sense to me was, I went through it over here, hardware. Hardware. That's it. I wrote down the word hardware, and I got excited. You know, like a little little prairie dog in my head was up. I'm like, anybody else seeing this? This is exciting. Have you guys ever had that? That feeling when you've just done something so tiny, but it just feels so right, it just feels so good. And this was that moment. It was like, holy crap, anybody who see this? I'm looking, Arnhem, let's do another one. Nope, nope. Abacus. And I just kept going, I kept building, building, building. And all of a sudden, I've got a word list. But make no mistake, Pictionary did not start with a big idea, it did not start with a grand plan, it started with the word art fun. Because when I wrote that word, I became a game inventor, no longer a waiter. One simple word to get started. So I've got the, the word list going. Now I have to figure out what to do. I gotta figure out how to put this thing together. First thing I need, partner. I know my strengths, and they aren't management, they aren't operations. I like marketing, sell, vision. I like you know getting in there. I like you know talking. So I had to get two partners. One was a graphic artist. Mr. Pictionary cannot draw. I'm horrible. So I needed a graphic artist to do the graphics. And then I also needed somebody to do the operations. Well, I asked this friend of mine, and he joined, and he said, Yeah, sure. But it, it just didn't quite feel right. It was something. The vibration, it just didn't seem like the right thing at this moment. But he came on anyway. Two weeks later, he quit. It was like, it was meant to be, right? The universe, I had to trust the universe was going to give me the right partner. Two weeks later, in a play test with the same friend of mine, friend of his game, who was the perfect partner. So instead of panicking over something gone wrong, I just kind of had to go with the flow. I had to trust that the right person would come along. And he did. So now, so now we've got we've got uh, an idea. We have no idea what to do with this, how to get it started. So we went and borrowed thirty five thousand dollars from my uncle. Now, when I was in college, the reason I got a 2.9 was because I had to put myself through school. My father couldn't pay anymore, so I, I'm in. I'll do it. So I had to work full time and go to school, but I ran out of money. I wasn't going to quit anymore, so I bought $2,000 from my uncle. And the deal was I'd pay him back nine months after I graduated, whatever I could afford. So, nine months, I'd write him a check for Five dollars. Sometimes I'd send him a note, no money this month. Hope you're having a good day. But I always acknowledge the debt. Stuff doesn't go away. You don't ignore it. It's going to be there when you get back. You have to acknowledge. I had to acknowledge that I owed him this money. So when I went to get the investment, he didn't. He had no idea what Pictionary was, but he knew when he said, "I was a man of my word," and that's why he invested. Not because of the game, but because I was a man of my word. So we get the thirty-five thousand, and now we have to figure out how to put a game together. 
So this is before the internet. This is the internet of the day. There was no one company that would put all the games, the other games together start to finish. Nine companies we had to find. We went with the yellow pages. Anybody actually physically open the yellow pages? <laughs> nice. Congratulations. So that's what we did. And then we needed boxes. We found your boxes, found a box name. Nice. Cute. Page after page. Meeting after meeting. And we had nine companies supplying us with parts. And all those parts came together. You want a part? Yeah. Couldn't go to the bathroom without stepping on something. But what 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 started happening though is I started looking back at what had transpired. What, what, there's some connection to everything that's gone up until this point where we actually almost have a game produced. And it's the one thing that has driven me my entire life to this day. It's why Pictionary is what it is. It's because I was open. An acronym for opportunity, possibility, epiphany, and now. The one thing, the one thing I'd have you write down, you remember anything, because this is this is the philosophy that's driven everything in my life. So opportunity for hope. There's always opportunity, right? To meet somebody new, to you, a new philosophy coming your way, trying a new beer, right? When my roommate said, "Do you want to play this new game?" That was an opportunity. I didn't know my life would change from playing a silly game. So opportunities, big and small, not all Shark Tank moments, but there's tons of them every day. Possibility. This is the one where you don't judge those opportunities. I can't draw. If I had said I can't draw and judge myself, I would have never played. Picture it never would have happened. So don't judge yourself, but don't judge things as they're coming your way. The epiphany, that's the, that's the holy moly, holy moly moment. When I was playing Pictionary, it was a blast. That was my aha moment. My, my intuition was going, this is a blast. I'm going to turn this into a game. But as you recall, I didn't turn it into a game. I didn't do anything. I panicked. So without the end, which is now, which is the, you've got to take action. You've got to jump. You've got to move forward. So my now was a simple word, aardvark. But you have to take action. Otherwise, well, just an idea rattling in your brain, or my brain in that case, you've got to take action. So by taking action, O-P-E-N, uh, every great experience in my life is because of that, that little progression. And so now we've got a game, we put it all together. Uh, well, we had a few problems putting the game together. Uh, we did a thousand games. There's 500 cards per game. So that's 500,000 individual Game cards. The printer said, Oh, yeah, we could do that. It'll be X amount in this amount of time. We already sent out the invitations to the launch party. He calls me up, new bid. What do you mean, new bid? He couldn't do it. We had six days to hand holy half a million game cards. Moved all the furniture out of my apartment, eight foot tables, went to Nordstrom. Got 170 shoe boxes, put them on the table, and 16 hours a day for six days, hand collated, half a game cards. But the thing was, the difference was, instead of, okay, we were pissed. I was gonna be, put a nice shining light on it, but it was, it was not a fun time, except what happened was, we bonded as a team. We had this common enemy, which was these cards, we just bought it. The whole team, my partners, even some friends that came by. So even though it was a, not the greatest moment, it turned into a really big plus. And it just helped us all keep the vision, all kept us kind of going in the same direction. So we put the games together. So now I have to sell the game. I've got to practice what I preach, this open, open thing. So we didn't know what the rules were for selling a game. We didn't ask. We said, all right, whatever feels right, whatever works in here, we're gonna go do it. So I literally <laughs> take the game, 
Do you remember the blue box? Big long electron, uh, excuse me, uh, rectangular box. So the original game that, uh, that we did, we developed the board before we did the box. Again, thinking outside the box, we built it from the outside, in, excuse me, from inside, inside out. So got the game, I've got a deal. So I literally put the game under my arm, kind of want to go left or right. Okay, left. And I would start walking down the street to anybody to sell them anything. I figured if you sold anything, you might as well sell a picture. I'd be in the box of what everybody else did. <laughs> my, my first sale was to the University of Washington bookstore. They don't sell games, but they sell all kinds of other stuff, so why wouldn't they sell games? So I went, actually went to the appointment, uh, got to the door, realized, forgot the sample, went back in the car, of course, Obviously, the doors are locked, and the car's still running. I was so nervous, I didn't even turn the car off. I just panicked. I sold them six games. I went that way. I wound up selling six games to a real estate company. Who is, what real estate company? I said, you know, if somebody comes and looks at a house, having a game on the counter, family values, they took six. Hardware stores, bookstores. It was an amazing time. To Nothing mattered. I mean, nothing. Nothing held us back. And so now we also have to market. We got to get it. We have to get it off the shelf. So we would do goofy things like we take the picture of Kitty, and we go up to a place with the most foot traffic in town, open the game, and just start playing in the middle of the restaurant. What are you doing? Hey, we're playing a game. Let's just sit. People come. We just start playing. We tell them where to go buy it. We were just having a ball. We would do uh, <laughs> we tip what he's called store check. So we'd go into the store, and if the uh, we didn't like the placement of Pictionary, I'd rearrange their game for them. <laughs> One partner would stand over there, you know, doing lookout for the manager, and I would take I'd rearrange up a trivia pursuit on the bottom shelf, of course, a competition, <laughs> and put us at iPhone. Uh, we used to uh, be doing that kind of thing all the time. So we weren't hamstrung by any rule. Nobody had sold to a bookstore before. We started that. But our biggest, our biggest uh, deal was selling each to Norsecum. Never know when it's all coming around. First we borrowed their shoes, boxes. Now we're selling to Norsecum. Getting a little traction. People starting to pay attention to us. So this is, we're getting excited. This is like, all of a sudden, we're starting to think a little bigger. Maybe we've got something here. I go to nursery, no shoe department, I mean, no game department, of course. They've never sold a game in their life. So I'm giving the buyer for the accessory department anything she wants. I'll take them back. I'll hand deliver them. Whatever you need, I'll do. In fact, I'll do demonstrations. I will stand at the bottom of the escalator, downtown Nordstrom, a little table like this, and anybody that comes down the elevator, I'm just like, play my game, play my game, I just anything I can do to get people to play. And it works. It worked. People start playing the game. And they started paying attention. And they started really enjoying the game. And the more we played, and the more people played, the more games were sold. And that was a huge shift for us. And for me personally, I started getting my first picture of what success looked like. I started after all these steps, after the word art book, after finding my partner, after putting the game together, all these little steps started adding up to me <coughs> finally visualizing and being able to draw my picture of success. And it was millions of games. No more trying to sell games out of my car. No more trying to stand at the bottom of the escalator and doorsteps. We're gonna sell millions of games. That was my drawing of success. Okay, let's do that. How do you do that? How do you scale this thing? We have no idea. We couldn't do it. Couldn't keep selling out of the back of my car. So we had the license. Licensing, basically, a big company does everything: manufacturing, distribution, marketing, sales, and gives us a royalty. Love that. We wound up with it's the only way we're gonna get. To where we need to be, and I'm going to get my picture success. 
So Milton Bradley comes calling. Everybody was taken. Milton Bradley, the biggest AIDS company in the world, calls us. We go out for a meeting. We're going to bring a license to say. And we walk in. We walk in to the meeting, and the guy shakes our hands like this. He's got something behind his back. He's got like a present or something for us. Hey, honey, nice to meet you. And all of a sudden, and on the table, he throws down this thing. It was a box, we think, and we can barely make out the word Pictionary. What's that? Well, this is what we're going to do for you, huh? We're going to change the graphic. We're going to change the rules. We're going to change the words. You're going to sell a million games. Anybody? Would anybody think that's a good idea? No. Who said no way? So we realized in that moment, and for your businesses, your life, and everything, nobody, this was this, for your businesses, for your life, for everything, this became our prime directive. Rule number one, nobody will love our game as much as we will. Nobody will love our game as much as we will. They'll try to change it, they'll try to make it different. But we know what works. I know what works for me personally. People are gonna try to change me, no. People are gonna try to change my product, no. So we kind of got, it took a little work, we got past that, we called it the eye chart. And we wind up with a really good deal. They gave us a contract that is going to get me millions of games. My vision, they're going to sell millions of games. I really believe they will. They gave us a huge royalty rate, gave us marketing spend, gave us all these guarantees. But the one thing they wouldn't put in writing was they wouldn't touch the package without our written approval. So we give it to them and they could turn it into this eye chart if they want. I'm 27 years old. I'm making $500 a month. I'm driving a 10 year old car, and all I have to do is sign that contract, and I'm a millionaire. Standing there, a pen in hand, and I'm looking at the contract, and I, I was sweating because I couldn't do it. Couldn't sign the contract because nobody's going to love Pictionary as much as we will, and I couldn't do it. It wasn't the right, didn't feel right, it wasn't the right business decision. It wasn't the right thing to do. We had no plan B. There's only voice for it. We had no plan B. If this doesn't work, I'm back to waiting table. We're not selling enough games. Somebody else can come in. It was worth the risk. We had to stay true to our beliefs, what we knew was right. And I gave up being a millionaire because it was the right thing to do. We went right back to slogging games out of my car. I'm knocking on doors. We're doing all the things we were doing in the past and praying that something was going to happen. Something happened. A month later, through channels and through connections, we got another offer. Because we waited, because we stayed firm to our beliefs, we got an offer that was more money, all the guarantees we want, and as a joint venture with all the guys who sold Trivia Pursuit, the company that manufactured all the Trivia Pursuits, and the guy who coordinated everything about Trivia Pursuit. Biggest selling game ever. This is a pretty good deal. So finally, we got our deal. We signed the contract. We signed the contract. And so here I am, 27. Looks like I'm going to be a millionaire. Now what do I do? I stay with it. Nobody's gonna love it like we do. I stayed for 16 more years after signing that contract and we traveled the world marketing on our own money, uh, promoting, making sure the licensees were doing what they're supposed to do, came out with new versions, but we stayed with it. There's no shortcut to success. If we had walked away, knowing that I had that check, knowing that I had that signature on that contract, picture it would not have been what it was, guaranteed. It was a great game, everybody loved it, but without our involvement, it wouldn't have done, it wouldn't have stayed where it was. So there's no shortcut, and it worked. Time after time after time, executives told us, without us involved, Pictionary would have died out long before it ever did, or would have died out. So now, 
60 years later, after all this work, it was time, it was time to sell. It was time to move on at this point. So I'm 43 and gonna sign a contract, get ready to sign it. And all of a sudden I realize my picture of success has been met. Now what? Now what do I do? I gotta do another, I gotta find another what success means. This isn't, I didn't plan for this. This isn't what I wanted. I thought I had it worked out. It was gonna sell a million games. Okay, we had physically, we had sold a million games. So we signed the contract and I knew that I had to change and get a new picture for success because it changes all the time. It changes all the time. And when you make your picture of success, if it doesn't work or it's not what you want or what you don't need, make another one. You're gonna change, I changed. Not the same guy I was back then. So I looked at what it was that success meant for me personally and what you said, freedom. Freedom to do what I want, when I want, I can mentor, I can do nonprofits. I can start another business. I don't have to start another business. The, the, I had the freedom to be a service to other people. That's what I crave. And that's what I worked for. And I didn't realize it when I was younger, but that's probably what I would have drawn when I was younger. So I got this vision now, this picture of success, which is freedom. And I got this money. How do I protect freedom? This is what I got, how do I protect what I want? Well, story goes, it was five of us that all cashed out around the same time. And four of them decided to do something different, start new businesses. They decided they were smarter than the business they were in. And they went investing and they did all these things. And guess what? They're all working for Starbucks or Costco now. I wasn't gonna do that. So I wanted to protect my freedom. So I did everything I could, financially, emotionally, spiritually, to protect my freedom. Well, that's what I wanted. So if you're out there and you know what your thing is, you know what your picture of success is, protect it. Protect it, whatever you gotta do, make sure you hold on to it. Because you only get that one shot at it. And then you take it and you take it, it's beautiful. And that's what I've done. And that's my whole life has been like that. And that's why I'm standing here. Not because of Pictionary, not because of anything else, because I know what I want. I know what I needed. That's why I'm standing here. So it doesn't matter what you visualize. It doesn't matter what you're thinking or how long it takes you to get there. But if you just follow your passion, follow your dreams, I guarantee you one day you'll find your right book. We open up for some questions. Uh, what, was the, what was the profit margin like on the games when you signed them? <laughs> <laughs> I left that story out. I usually tell that's a great story. So the question was what were the profit margins on the game? So when we produced the thousand games in my apartment and we had nine different companies supplying us with parts. They were $22 hard cost for those parts. Forget the hundreds of hours we put in, it was 22 bucks. We wholesaled them for $15. We lost $7 a game. But our competitor was Trivial Pursuit. They were selling for 30 and there was no deep discounting. So everybody put the price in half, so it's 15 bucks. We had no choice to compete. We had to sell it for $15. We had to hope we'd sell more games quantity and once we started scaling our went for 1,000 games we produced 10,000 games the thousand cost us 22 bucks the 10,000 eight dollars and 60 cents yeah so without that completely unsustainable business model at 22 bucks
can see like a few like pillars and back even when you could have built quickly at that point. What was it like to sort of team them? I mean, did you ever have any disagreement? And how did you manage that with like a core of like members of the team? Uh, the question was how do we handle disagreement and with you know the, did we how do we handle disagreement? Mm -hmm. So there was three part. And the one thing we had, we all had to share the same vision. We all were going the same direction. So we didn't have to worry about when we got in arguments that somebody was saying, well, I feel bad. It was about going in the same direction. So we got in arguments, we knew it was for Pictionary. The story is, so one of the partners was a graphic artist, Gary Everson. And he designed this beautiful package, little lettering on the blue box for Sam. Terry, my other partner, goes for a press check and changes the color to white without telling the graphic artist. I'm in complete agreement. Game comes back. Gary goes absolutely crazy. You changed my color. You changed it. I spent and spent all this time making this box beautiful. And I'm going, Gary, Gary, relax, man. It looks better. Just, just take a look at it. Look at the product. Take your ego out of this decision, and what do you think? Ah, he's yelling and screaming, throws it down, walks out, finally comes back. Looks at it, looks at his work. Looks better, you're right. And we moved on. He took his ego out of the decision. So a lot of times all we're trying to do is protect ourselves from pain, from hurt, from whatever. And so it, it manifests so many different ways with your business associates, your friends. So. If you can manage to take your ego out and just listen, it eliminates a lot of the hassle. So I'm curious, you got the game also on television. He did. So what was it like going from being one distribution channel of games to then being a TV show and the TV show, how did that impact the sale of board game? It depends which country you're talking about. So what, what we wound up doing in this contract, uh, the contract with the North American group, which was the joint venture, we retained all the rights to everything outside of board games. So we had the television show, we did line extensions, we did promotion, and all of those did start increasing our sales. The TV show specifically, the, the fun part about that was, the show was second to win, lose, or draw. Remember, there was a TV show called Windows of Draw, 1987, 10 years before our show came out. It was based on Pictionary, Burt Reynolds and Burt Comby, and they're playing in the living room, but everybody thought it was Pictionary. Our sales increased because of the television show. It's a half an hour commercial for them, but everybody thought it was us. And so he wound up getting the, the sales from it. And when they went off the market, we were the last big drawing game left. And the distribution channels you're talking about, we would we would put that thing into different things. Toy stores, game stores, you know, you had to be there. But we pioneered, like we said, bookstores, uh, the TV show, all these different places that games were not traditionally sold, we were in there. Really what it does, it just opens it up to the consumer to finding a different channel, different places to find it. So they don't have to go to it was KB Toys and all the rest of it. So just as many part, uh, tentacles as we can put out there, that's how they do it. What does that look like in today's world right now? Because I was really interested in hearing how after you came up with the game, you're going to bookstores and getting these things, Nordstrom, you know, that were unheard of before. Yeah. So what does that look like today? Because I'm personally developing a game right now, and after doing all the versions and everything, I'm at that next stage, but I don't know kind of how to promote it. Uh, she's doing her own game, and how, how, how do you promote that? Uh, well, there's this thing called the internet that <laughs> is actually good and bad. It does give you an avenue to put it out there. On the other hand, with a game, people have to play it. It's a touchy feeling. You can't just tell people about it. So you have to play it. And so you can sell it through, uh, through Amazon and all the other uh, online distribution, but you've got to get it in people's hands. You've got to get to play it. But then you've got to keep following up with them, right? Because the attention span of people is not quite what it used to be. 
So start with a small group and go from there, but definitely sell on Amazon. It's not to say not to sell it on the internet, but you gotta promote it. We did these things called kickbacks because we needed people to play the game. Word of mouth still is what drives stuff. Still word of mouth, you know, it's Yelp and all the rest of it, but your friends are telling you something. Go try this beer, give this thing, okay, you're gonna pay attention. So it's still word of mouth. Uh, we, did these, we did these things called pickbacks. We wanted people to remember Pictionary and have an experience without actually having to buy the game. Had a paper, four pen, excuse me, pencil, and some cards. And we would throw these things all over town. I mean, hundreds of them made up, but it was to get the pencil in people's hands. There are limits. Uh, stopped at red light, there was this guy in a convertible, and I threw the pick back at him and jumps out of his car. And I take off as fast as I can. So I think he's gonna beat me up. Yeah, so you gotta you gotta you have to get people to, to touch it, to see it, to feel it. It's a feeling. Games are a feeling. Picture is a feeling. Picture isn't drawing pictures. Picture is a feeling. And that's why I put something tangible, I put feeling in a box. Um, thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. Uh, and also, um, and thank you for just like explaining the big bunny and sticking with you, who you are and who you are as a company. And I think that's very inspiring. And I wanted to know what you would, would you, what part of your success would you attribute to what you Like, did you, do you think you made opportunities for yourself when you kind of some of these record labs that you need to get luck involved and right place, right time type of thing? Uh, the question was how much did luck play a role? Nothing, I'm brilliant. <laughs> but the real answer, you know, how, how much does luck play a role in this? Luck and timing, a bunch. I mean, a, a lot. I mean, if we had to come out with Pictionary for the timing part, if we had to come out with Pictionary a year earlier or a year later, it may not have been successful. If it came out when I started up two years earlier, I may not have found those two partners that were perfect to match my skill set to make the product go. So timing was absolutely <laughs> essential for picture and work. And as far as luck goes, huge. I mean, you can learn everything as you go. I mean, we, we, we learned as we went. We didn't have the skill sets to make this big game. We had to rely on our, our hearts, our intuition, and a lot of luck on the timing of things. Um, it's a combination of both. Luck, you know, luck, timing, hard work, they all play a big, big factor in success. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> so when you sold Pictionary, there was uh, one thing in particular that you sold that was sell. Like, can you talk about that story of how you, how you able to get the name? <coughs> kind of IP? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so when, I uh, said intellectual property, so when, we did picture, we started Pictionary. We trademarked the name Pictionary. We didn't patent drawing on paper, grades on paper. We had trademarked the name Pictionary. And that was our intellectual property. That's where our value was. Because there were a lot of different drawing games on the marketplace. There's 57 other drawing games over the years in different countries. But what we owned was the name Pictionary. Nobody could copy, nobody could use it. So when we sold the company to Mattel in 2001, we didn't sell them inventory. We didn't sell them a website. All we sold them, and they paid a lot of money, was for the intellectual property. The name Pictionary was the only thing that had value. More? Yeah. There's a story about how you got the name, though, of how you were able to get the intellectual property. I don't know if you want to share that or not. <laughs> you shared it with us last year. Be sure to be quick. The dictionary story? Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I, I can't take credit for coming up with the name Pictionary. It's been one of my best friends. Uh, we were playing one night, and this was back in the house, just post college days, and we were sketching. And anybody heard of the game Balderdash? So, that's a game based on Pictionary. So, you give a word, and everybody makes up their meaning, what they think it is. And you guess what it is? Well, he says one night, uh, Pictionary instead of Fiction. We go, great, that's the name of the game. So we get these thousand games put together, we're getting ready to go, 
and we go for our trademark application, and we were denied because somebody had the name Pictionary. Confusion in the marketplace is what the patent office said. Trademark office. Said, okay. So we uh, decided to do uh, what wasn't normal at the time. We couldn't afford a lawsuit. We couldn't afford the time, what that would take. So I picked up the phone and I called the guy. Right. Mr. Fictionary, uh, I don't see there's any, you know, my voice is probably like this. You know, Mr. Fictionary, Mr. Fictionary, I don't see that there's any confusion. We're a drawing game, we're a guessing game. Da, 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 da. And why did we have the phone? End of the phone. And I'm terrified because we're going to have to change everything if he denies us. He said, okay. I mean, it was like, if he hadn't have done that, we would have changed the name. We had a, would have started over. Uh, it would have been an absolute disaster. He said, yeah, sure. And so we immediately sent the, his letter of not opposing our trademark into the office and got it done. But if that hadn't have come through. And I, I love that story because that talks about the human side of business. The fact that you picked up the phone and called them just like one person or the other explain the situation. Can you uh, can you share about your journey after Pictionary? Because you've done some really cool things that uh, I know you've written about in the book and uh, maybe you shared with uh, you know, it's one other thing to write down, is if you want, uh, Angel Rob, the two Bs, uh, at Angel Rob, two Bs, is my web, is my uh, Instagram. And I post about being open, right? So I live this stuff. This isn't just me telling you guys something I don't believe in. Uh, eventually, uh, as he says, I'll be having a book coming out. But uh, I've had a pretty good life. I, I, taking this freedom thing to the nth degree, not just for stuff. I mean, I go to Burning Man. Have you been to Burning Man? Why did I know that? <laughs> <laughs> so I've been to Burning Man, whale shark, I travel the world. I do a lot of fun things, but the current iteration of what I'm doing is uh, my object of freedom is a spiritual journey. It's just been amazing, all the people that I've met, all the things that I've been able to feel and see and look back on that I was doing with Pictionary without knowing it. We were, we were present every day with Pictionary because if we weren't, we lose focus and it's, it's going to crater. So now I'm present every day as much as I can. I surrendered when my partner quit and I had to get another partner. I just surrendered the fact that it was going to happen. Now it's surrendered to the love and the light, and everything has happened. So it's just been an amazing journey that I'm on right now. Um, and it never ends. I mean, I could write another picture of success tomorrow. It's just a different every day. And I'm grateful and blessed. Uh, I truly am. I worked hard, but I'm, I'm living the life I want to lead. Nobody else, nothing anybody else tells me to do, what I should be doing. When you graduate college, People are going to tell you what you should do with your degree and go do all this stuff. Whatever that is, do what's right for you. And if it's the wrong, turn around and go a different direction. You're never stuck in one path. It's okay to take the wrong path. Just turn around if it's not working. Well, um, I have one age when you were able to pay back and send your uncle over. Yeah. And what was that moment like for you when you were able to finally you know, hand him your money back? <laughs> the reason I'm chuckling is nobody would ask, ever asked me that question. That's a great question. When did I pay him back, my uncle back? And what did it feel like? It felt great. I mean, it was one of those, you know, I, I wasn't really pondering was a man of my word, but I started paying him back immediately. You know, those nine months, I was still waiting tables. And it took me about two years to pay him back. And I, I got it done and it felt great. And it felt absolutely great because I had a debt. I had something that I had to repay. And when I mailed off that last check, I was like, freedom. This is awesome. I felt great. So yeah, it was it was only two thousand dollars. That was a lot of money back. And so yeah, it felt wonderful 
to not have that responsibility anymore. They got more responsibility elsewhere. But having that one felt really good, felt really emotional to take care of that. Thank you for that memory. So when you make a trip together, you guys work together. Yeah. And at that time, you don't sell anything yet. You can create, so how you survive? How you, like each of you, how, or you put money together, or what do you do? No, before we went, when we started getting a little traction, we paid our, the question was basically, how do we pay ourselves? Uh, we didn't have any money for salary. And so I kept waiting tables. And Terry, my business partner, he uh, was working as a controller for a company. So he had uh, his job and credit cards, which I didn't have at the time. And Gary, the graphic artist, was working for a magazine. And so we didn't have any money to put into the business. It was all came from my uncle from that investment. But we had to keep ourselves going. But 500 bucks a month eventually is what we wanted to pay ourselves until the first royalty check came in, which was 14 months later. And I don't usually tell this, but our uh, first royalty check was for 170,000 bucks. So it was 500 bucks to this, right? We worked hard for it, but it was just it was just fun time, and and it. To talk about the team aspect of it a little bit, I mean, we were three guys that had nothing in common. We had nothing in common. There's no reason for us to have met, but we did. It just was the right, it was luck that we all got together, but we all shared the same vision, the same dream, the same passion, and that's what kept us going. And without the team, picturing doesn't happen the way it does. It may not have happened at all. The team is important to. to fill in my gaps, not all be the same people. And it was just, it just worked out beautiful. Um, when you say that like money changed from like when you just have it to now, when you like say it's a family, your company together, so what is each man doing? What is the need to that bank? And did it ever combine it to like maybe? What, is, what did money mean to you then? What does it mean to me now? Um, money's money's fun, but money isn't doesn't drive me. Never had, even though I just gave you that number. Money's money's never been important, but it's what I can do. And if I don't have any money, I'm still having fun. I'm still enjoying. So, yeah, when I made some money, yeah, I was just enjoying differently. I was traveling. I was doing all these fun things, but I wasn't. It's not my style. I didn't buy Ferraris. I didn't buy. A lot of houses didn't do a lot of things with the money. It's always been about experiences for me. Picturing is an experience. Life for me is an experience. And so the money I spend is always, almost always on life and an experience. And so now that I have it, it's just bigger, but it's just the same experiences. I traveled to Europe in 19, before Picturing for five months. My budget was $14 a day. I had a blast. You're cringing. It was great fun. Hitchhiking, living in the tent. Didn't matter at $14 a day. I didn't have any money. If I had more money, I would have had more fun. I just would have done it differently. So money is money's great. And what you know, I James Altucher said this the other day on his, his podcast. He goes, All money does is make sure you don't have money troubles. You still have other things to deal with. It doesn't cure everything, it doesn't make everything go away. And it's true. So just Enjoy whatever makes you happy with whatever you have. Trust me, start that now. Don't get too caught up in the whether you have money or not. Really. So, you talked about cosmic gravy <laughs> and uh, seeing Pictionary on tonight's show, Jimmy Fallon and the celebrities playing, playing it. What, what's it like now that you know that you know, a billion people have played the game that you created? Just seeing the path that it's gone through. Let's add me a couple of instances where you felt that. Yes, we call it we call we call it pictionary stories that are emotional or not about the game. Grip cosmic gravy stories. Uh, I I suffered okay. I suffered a couple of things. Depression. I don't really was happy, happy every day. 
I took a leave of absence for Pictionary for about 10 months. We don't know if it was Pictionary related or what, but I just couldn't deal and I had to get away. So I took a leave of absence. I had to get my head on straight. I had to get myself feeling right again. So if you're ever in that position, it's okay. I had the support at the time of my wife, my partners. It was a hard time. I was overwhelmed and I had to get away. So that was, that was a very difficult time. But again, with the support of uh, family and friends, I got through it. And the other one was what they call the imposter syndrome. Sold Pictionary. And for a couple of years, we had sold 38 million games. I'm hugely successful. I did that. But guess what? My brain said I didn't deserve it. It was my partners that did it. Without them, it doesn't happen. Whether it's real or not, it doesn't matter. That's what was in my head. This imposter syndrome was eating me up. And I, I couldn't get out of it. And it was hard. It was really hard to not think I was worthy of my success. Rational or not, it doesn't matter. That's how I felt. One day I'm have, having dinner in a restaurant. Waitress standing there. And she says, uh, I heard you made a picture. Yeah. She says, uh, starts crying. She says, uh, thank you. That she was a foster child. And her the kids of the parents would not accept her. And she was ostracized. She felt out of it. And she wasn't a part of the family. One day they bring out Pictionary. They start playing Pictionary. Guess what? She can draw. Everybody wants to be on her team now. They want to win. They want to play Pictionary. So now she's gone from being an outsider to everybody wanting to play with her. And this experience that Pictionary brought to this young woman's life changed her life, changed her dynamic. That's the stories. Those are the cosmic gravy stories that resonate. Those are the, that, that's why Pictionary happened. Not to give you stuff. That's why Pictionary happened. I'm convinced of that. Didn't see that coming. <clears throat> what do you think drives you to pursue your picture of success? Because it's never done. I'm always striving for another picture. What drives me for my picture of success? Well, there's, and there's not just one picture, but I have that freedom. But my picture is now being redrawn to do this. I want to spread whatever story I have. I want to share my journey. And this is my new picture of success. I've done a picture, I've got my freedom. I've got the freedom to do this or not. But this is what I choose to do. So standing up here, bearing my soul a little bit, telling you my story, if I can influence you guys in any way, in a positive way, that's my new picture of success. And that's what I'm striving for. All right, well, we appreciate you, Rob. Thank you so much. <laughs> the Center for Entrepreneurship, we just want to give you a certification of, certificate of appreciation, and thank you again for coming in. Thank you. Uh, very soulful, honest, um, and relevant talk. So thank you. For everybody that's joined us, uh, thanks for taking your Friday afternoon to come back to campus. We have food for you out in the lobby. And you can come up and, and hang out with us and join us for dinner. Um, but have a great weekend. And uh, next Friday, we have uh, a guest speaker coming from Professor Webb's class. So you'll see some posters about that. I hope you guys can join. Um, but have a great weekend. And see you on Tuesday. Thanks.